So so excited to hear Jamie. I've known Jamie for years, but I've, I've never heard her speak. So I'm very excited to um, be here with you guys today. So I'm gonna go through a little housekeeping first. So today's class is being broadcast from San Diego Oasis, and we would like to welcome those of you who may be joining us from around the country. Before class begins, I have a couple of housekeeping items regarding Zoom to share that will especially help the online participants. There is a volunteer helping behind the scenes, but these steps will help everyone enjoy their learning experience today. First, please be sure that your microphones are muted for the duration of today's lecture. As you should see on your screen, Zoom now offers closed captioning. If you prefer to view the class without captions, simply turn it off using the live transcript icon on your screen. We'll be taking questions at the end of class, which our Zoom volunteer will help facilitate. If you have a written question, please send it in using the Zoom chat. If you have a question you'd like to ask out loud, you can use the raise hand feature in the Zoom software or unmute yourself and, and we'll work with behind the scenes volunteer to repeat your question to the audience before answering. Okay. Great, excellent. So uh, like I said, my name is Julie and I am with Aging Well Partners and Aging Well Partners is a collection of service providers. And one of the um, service providers that we have is Jamie Shapiro. And so what we've noticed, we've both been in this industry for quite a while. And what we've um, learned is that no, no one of us can meet all of your needs, right? So what I do is I help um, families find assisted living, memory care, and home care. But I need to partner with Jamie in order to um, help our clients get into assisted living um, or memory care. And so, um, or even stay in your own home, right? If you want to stay in your own home and be safe in your own home, you may want to do some downsizing. So today we're going to hear from um, Jamie. So happy to have her here. So Jamie, come on up. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Can you guys see me over the podium? I'm not the <laughs> tallest person in the room, I promise you. <laughs> um, okay, so since I am, um, I don't like that barrier there, I'll just do this and um, okay. So welcome, I am um, going to work with you guys a lot today and want to kind of give you an idea of what to expect. And um, hopefully um, you will have some fun. And you should know that I really want to be a comedian. So this is part information, part comedy. Okay. Um, so today you're going to learn what is senior move management. And I always like to gauge the audience. How many of you have ever heard of senior move management? Can you raise your hand? Senior move management or the National Association of Senior Move Managers. Wow, okay, well then you are in the right spot because people don't even know that my industry exists. I'm, act exists. I'm actually gonna be going to the national conference. It's gonna be our 20th anniversary and Silver Linings Transitions, that's my company, is gonna be celebrating 10 years. So I, I just like to get a, a baseline of where we're at and we'll go from there. We're gonna talk about why, why we hold on to stuff. Um, so I'm going to learn a little about you guys when we get into that part. Um, why does being organized matter? And um, I, you know what, have you guys, I'm sure, heard the term hindsight is 2020, right? So I feel like when you learn what I do, you're going to understand why I'm up here um, giving you this, this talk. Tips to organize and downsize. And um, what do you do with all of the things that you don't keep? So we have a lot to cover. First, I'd like to introduce to you who I am because it's pretty relevant to the topic. So I am Jamie Shapiro, and I am the founder owner of Silver Linings Transitions. As I mentioned, we're going into our 10th year of business, and we are a senior move management company. And um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about what senior move management is, and let's get back to this. Okay, so I'm going to paint this scenario for you. This was a client who was living in a Carmel Valley two-story home with marble staircases and a hard landing. Her husband had the beginning of dementia, cognitive impairment, and he was still okay, but you could see that things were not going to go well. And they made the decision that they were going to, actually they had caregivers coming into the house and the combination of the caregivers and adult daughters who had not been home to visit their mother, their mother and father, um, made the decision that it sounded like it was time for them to go to a community, which is where somebody like Julie, who does placement, would come in. So we were called in, and as it turned out, the, um, the clients had hoarding disorder. 
And you can actually see in that top left picture what we were coming into on the first day. And we knew we weren't gonna be moving them the next day. So what we needed to do before we could do anything else was to declutter the home and get it safe for them just to live there. And um, we're gonna talk a little bit about hoarding disorder. I'm actually gonna be doing a full talk on it because it seems that people are fascinated by their TV shows, their books. Um, and going back to this, I actually come from a family with hoarding disorder. So I am a unique person to talk about it. So when I get the phone call from somebody and I can tell when I show up at the door, if I think there's something going on and you probably know people or know neighbors who you're starting to see a little bit of Sanford and Son in the front yard, um, that is hoarding disorder. And there's a lot of shame and embarrassment around it. And so I always like to just let them come out, you know, very early and say, I understand hoarding disorder better than most people. My mom has hoarding disorder. And um, if I am not careful, back to that hindsight 2020, I may end up with hoarding disorder. Yes. Okay. They would like to see me. Okay. So you guys don't get to see me, but the people with the camera do. Is that okay? I should have worn my higher heels. Okay. So... There's actually a little bit of um, pre, uh, when you have a pre-warn, not pre-warning, I can't think of the word, I can't even think of it, for, for, forewarning of hoarding disorder. Do you know those adolescents that have those like really, really messy rooms? That is somebody who will, could have the tendency for hoarding disorder. That is actually my oldest child's room. And my room was equally as bad. Um, and so I actually have, I call it a, the gift of ADHD, which I didn't even know that I had until my mid forties because women didn't get diagnosed with it. But very often we're super bright and super creative and super cluttered. And if you saw like, Einstein's desk, he had, you know, probably had a little bit of, he definitely, I think had ADHD. I'm not diagnosing him. I'm not a doctor, but you know, it definitely goes hand in hand with creativity and intelligence. And, but I also, so I'm able to sort of like make people feel better about it because I do understand how we get there. And what happened with our client is that she had a triggering event and a pretty traumatic childhood. And those combinations brought on hoarding disorder. But why I'm sharing this with you is this is the worst case scenario. Most people, only 5% of the population live like this. So if, if this is, you know, what we were able to do for, for this couple, we can do a, a lot for other people. But we were able to work with them, do a floor plan about where they were going to be going, get them settled in nicely and safely into their new home. These are just some pictures of, of the process. And so what we do as senior move managers is we take away all of the worry and work of moves and make them magical. Here's my prop. So that's my big thing. We make moves magical. And um, so Julie hadn't seen my wand yet. Now, now you've seen it in action. Um, so that's a little bit about what senior move management does. We, we handle all the logistics of the move. But I think what's most important and why I'm here today is that typically our clients are downsizing. And you can't go from a family home that you've been in for 40 years into a smaller, either a smaller home that's single story and easier to maintain or into a community without some downsizing. And I would say the majority of people make slow decisions because the hardest part for them is letting go of their belongings. And we're going to talk about that. And um, I will tell you, as a result of this experience, I personally don't shop the way I used to. I went to Hawaii last year and my boyfriend is like, what are you going to bring back? And I'm like, I'm not bringing anything back. I'm going to take pictures because I know what happens, you know, when we collect a, a lifetime of belongings and I don't, I don't want to have to say goodbye to them. So that's a little bit about what mood management is. Now I want to get a sense of who you guys are and find out why you're here. Because I would venture to say, if you're sitting in this room, you might have a little too much stuff and you don't know what to do with it. Can I, can I hear, see any hands that say, yes, yes, that's me. Thank you. Thank you for being brave. And if you don't have too much stuff and you're looking for a job, we love people who are really good at organizing and being tidy. Okay, so who is in our audience today? So if you are holding on to items and this statement fits the reason that you're holding on to it, can you, and if you're in the audience on Zoom, if you want to raise your hand too, um, I, you can say, yes, there's some people here. I paid a lot for it when I bought it. Anybody that that fits? Okay, I see some hands. I, I believe it's worth a lot of money. Okay, so 
I'm holding on to it for my grandkids or children. Okay. And how many of you who are holding on to things for your children and grandchildren are getting the I don't want it? Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about how to handle that. Um, okay. If I fix it, it might be worth something. Anybody? Okay. All right. I'm going to give you the punchline on this one. You just spent easily six months in your home, right? Not able to leave. If you didn't fix it or use it, guess what? You're probably not going to. Um, I have a strong memory attached to the item. Anybody? Okay. It reminds me of someone. Um, I might use it again one day. <laughs> okay, so anybody willing to share how long they might use it again someday has been them that they haven't touched it? Anybody willing to be like, oh, it's been 20 years? Nobody? Okay, again, back to the COVID thing. If you didn't use it, maybe you're not going to. Um, I feel guilty about throwing it away. Okay, and I'm going to share something with you. People who have ADHD um, or hoarding disorder, a lot of why they hold on to things is they actually want to appropriately dispose of something. They feel real guilt about not putting things, you know, away, not recycling it, not doing what what you know the end product should be. So we're actually incredibly compassionate, you know, caring people. So uh, I don't mind being the poster child for someone with ADHD. And interestingly, I just discovered about two months ago that my mother has it and it just all clicked. I'm like, okay. So anyway, um, and then it represents someone I want to be. Like, here's an example. I always thought I'd play guitar. And so I bought this guitar and it's sitting in the corner collecting dust. Anybody have exercise equipment or something that they, they aspire to be? Okay. So I'm going to cover a lot of that for you today, but I like to get a sense of who's here. And if I didn't have any yeses to a question, then I'm like, okay, I'll skip it. But I had a yes to every single thing. So here's a little bit of hoarding humor. Um, by the way, we don't call them hoarders. We say they have hoarding disorder. Um, so I wanna always use the right language. Um, okay, so the joke is, <laughs> how many of you um, go to Costco and have more stuff than you'll ever possibly use, but it's a great price and so you buy it at Costco. So you're called a Costco hoarder. <laughs> a border hoarder is actually not really funny. I, I, when I put the slide together initially, really what it is, is it's somebody who probably could have hoarding disorder, but they haven't had a triggering event that has, you know, pushed them over the edge, or there's someone in their life that sort of is that buffer. I always tell people, and it's funny, I, a lot of times we'll have a husband and wife come in together and one person is like, what can you do to make her get rid of her stuff? Because this is driving me crazy. I said, well, you're normal. There's usually in a relationship, a filer and a piler. So you just have to figure out how to coexist. Um, but the border hoarder usually is somebody that could have hoarding disorder, except that circumstances haven't gotten to that point. And then the craft hoarder, how many of you, be honest, have like a, a necklace will break or something will break and you'll organize it and put it away so that it could be found because one day you might do a craft with it. I saw a hand go up. That's my personal picture. I can totally relate to you. We are called craft hoarders. Okay. So this is not the solution. And I will tell you, I hear it frequently from people when I do this talk. And I'm going to tell you why this is not the answer because you're gonna have two camps. You're gonna have one camp, which is, I don't want it, I'm done with it, take it all away. And there are gonna be things that you don't want that to happen to. And the other camp is actually what happened with my mom and how hoarding disorder started. So my mom, closed on her home on a Friday. She had just gone through a divorce and bought her first place on her own, closed on it on Friday. My grandfather had went into hospice the day before. He died on Sunday. Do you think my mom unpacked those boxes? No. Then she's grieving the loss of my grandfather, taking care of my grandmother. Nine months later, my grandmother passes away unexpectedly. My mother was very close with my grandmother, was not prepared to go through my mother's things. And all of my grandmother's things that family members didn't take went into my mom's house. And now we have hoarding disorder. It's that easy. It's usually a triggering event. And, you know, what I've noticed, and people have this perception of hoarding disorder, but when I meet people, and I, and I actually, a lot of times people will reveal, you would never know. They're usually very well kept together. Like I said, very smart, very fun. Um, and so I always like to sort of 
just talk about it because there does seem to be interest. But if you don't designate your wishes, um, one of two camps is going to happen. And the other thing that can happen, and this happened in my family, is we're going to fight over those belongings because, you know, what they say weddings and funerals bring out the, the worst in people. And um, in my own family, I had, when my aunt passed away, I had four cousins and police had to be called because they were grieving. And that was not the time to start dividing belongings. So it's much better for you to let your wishes be known. And we're going to talk about some of that today, too. Okay. So remember we talked about how many of you have loved ones who you um, want to take your things and they're saying no to you and right, we, I heard several people. Okay, well, just because they don't want your things, it doesn't mean that you aren't going to be loved or remembered. So when my grandmother passed away, I didn't tell you, but I was her only grandchild. So my mother wanted me to take my grandmother's china so that it would you know, stay in the family. And I had gotten married in 1999. Do you remember in 1999, we were still registering for China and there was still some hope of us sitting down at the dining room table and having the nice meals, remember? How many of us do that now? Exactly. So my mom wanted me to take my grandma's China and I'm like, I'm not even using my China, which I wanna take you back to this too. A little skipping, remember I told you I had ADHD, you were warned, okay. So um, this is one that I wanna make sure that I share. So the picture in the middle was my personal China that I had registered for for my wedding back in 1999. I went through a divorce. So I've actually downsized myself. I moved from Florida to California. So that was a downsize. My stepfather passed away in the family home. So I had to go and clear up my family home. And then I went through a divorce and I had to go through the belongings in my home and really experience what my clients experienced, which was really letting go of some of the dreams and the memories that I had made as a family with my ex-husband that I didn't want to take into the new space. So I, I have three children. I offered them, I said, if any of you wants my China, I will pack it away for you. I will store it until you're ready to take it. And I'm happy to give it to you. None of them wanted it. So I actually posted it on Facebook. I could have probably made a hundred, two hundred dollars for my China, my crystal. But I, for me, decided I'd rather put it into the universe and donate it because really our stuff is worth maybe 10% of what we think it is. And for me, it felt better to kind of put it out there. And it was really lovely because there was a couple who had gotten married during COVID before we started to have COVID weddings again. And they didn't have all the gifts and they didn't get the China and the crystal and they took mine. So that felt really good for me, but my kids didn't want mine. I didn't want my grandmother's, but back to this slide. Um, this lamp. So my grandmother passes away unexpectedly and my mother and uncle decide that that lamp should go to a favorite cousin, my grandmother's first cousin's daughter, who they had a very nice relationship. Her cousin was her best friend. But what they didn't know is that my grandmother had promised me from the age of four, because I was with her when she bought that lamp, that it was going to be mine one day. And my grandmother used to jokingly say, oh, your name's on the bottom of it. Well, guess what? My name was not on the bottom of it. So if you have an intention for something, make sure that you make your intentions known. But uh, you might be able to tell from the talk today that I might have a little bit of a persistent personality. And I now own that lamp and it is by my bedside. <laughs> but I still didn't want her china. So I loved my grandmother. I usually we used to when I she's been gone now 20 22 years, I used to tear up every, even when I would do this talk, I would tear up when I would talk about her. So I'm getting to where I don't, but I think of her every day. I didn't want her China because it didn't have a significance. And that's the other thing is that if you want to pass something down to somebody, it has to have a significance or relevance to them. Danny, are you friends with your um, she understood. She, yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, she, she understood. Okay. The other thing that affects consumption is generational differences. And I always tell people I can go into somebody's house and I can tell if they were part of the greatest generation. And I bet you guys can too, because they were really affected by having to ration. So they reuse and repurpose things that I know where my grandmother Remember those crystal light cups that we would, you would make the crystal light in the water and they had those little plastic cups. Well, my grandmother would line them up every day and put all of her daily pills in them. Like she could easily have gone and gotten, you know, a pill thing from the dollar store, but that's, that's what she wanted to do. That was the, what she came from. So I like to share this story. If you look at the picture with the floral couch, 
This was a couple that we were moving. They'd been married for more than 60 years. And this, when we, when we work with somebody, we help them figure out what furniture they're going to take. Part of the decision is what's safe for them and what's comfortable, what's easy to get up and down. Well, this was their living room sofa. Do you remember back in the days when we would have a living room that no one ever sat in and, and, and there was always plastic on the furniture to protect it? So this couch was preserved, you know, very, very well because nobody lived in the living room. In fact, now they're not even building houses with living rooms, but that's another story. Anyway, the movers were going to lift the sofa up to take it to the new place. And they were like, this is the heaviest sofa we've ever picked up. And that's because we used to make things sturdy and well, so they would last because people didn't want to spend money on something unless it was going to endure. And now we are in this disposable society where a lot of movers have something in their contract that says, uh, we're not going to be responsible if your Ikea furniture breaks, right? Um, okay. I also uh, want to just go back really quickly that I'm, I shared with you, remember how we used to have dinner around the dining room table and we had the buffets and people would display their china or the tchotchkes that they collected or the mementos from their trips. We don't really do that anymore. So if there are items that are significant to you, because we've already said, you know, our kids and our grandkids don't want our things. There's actually um, two things you can do. One is called to create a legacy list. And a legacy list is where you take, you take the 10 items that are the most significance to you and you document that and you let them know. What, like I have a bowl that belonged to my grandmother. It's um, the melamine bowl and it has the daisies on it. And probably you've seen it in a TV show if you've seen a show from the 70s or the 80s. Um, I am fairly certain, and I, I use it regularly, and I'm fairly certain that that would be an item that my children would fight about. But again, nobody wanted my china. So if they understand the significance of those items, they're more likely to say yes, but you also have to narrow that list down. And then the other thing that I like is a program called Artifacts, and it's A-R-T-I-F-C-T-S dot com, Artifacts, missing the A. And you can actually photograph those items and create a catalog and a story of the items that you you want to preserve. And what I tell my clients to do when you're downsizing is maybe you don't need to keep everything that you have. Maybe there are some things that you can photograph photograph for posterity, but you don't need to keep them. So that's another way to preserve those things. Um, and then for dividing belongings or category uh, cataloging, there's something called fair split, where um, we actually have seen it. We've used it in a divorce situation when the couples were dividing belongings, but it can also be, remember the story I shared with you about my own family where the police had to be called in? So fairsplit.com is a way to um, inventory everything that you have and, and do like a lottery system in a fair way of dividing those belongings. Um, fair, F A. F-A-I-R split, S-P-L-I-T dot com. Okay. I actually was a great speller when the third grade spelling contest, but if you ask me to do it while I'm, you know, yes, fair split. I think that's one of the resources that I shared with you guys. Okay. So we talked about generational differences. How many of you guys have either heard of the van life? Raise your hand if you've heard of van life. I see one hand or minimalist movement, the minimalist movement. So a lot of, especially these younger generations, they're bragging about how little they can live with. I think there's like one person that lives with a total of 40 items. But the van life is that, especially in California, there are people who are literally moving into vans or tiny houses and living on less. So that's part of the reason that we're having these challenges with downsizing is that there has to be a market for the item that you are selling. And if people don't want it, you can't sell it. Um, and I also think it helps you understand why your loved ones don't want your things. Okay. Am everybody good with my pace? And does anybody have any questions that I'm, I'm good so far? Okay, great. Another thing that I have noticed about this generation is that they collect experiences over things. They'd rather spend their money traveling. They'd rather take their pictures out and, and photograph it then and share it so everyone can see what they're doing rather than buying the magnet or the snow globe or you know the plate all right so now we're going to start getting into you know when you're looking at your own life it's really important to be you know realistic remember we talked about the um the guitar and buying the guitar and you know you think you're going to take the guitar lessons and then you don't take the guitar lessons 
Um, you know, do you really like to cook and bake? I mean, be, this is where you get honest with yourself. So when you're holding on to things, having an honest, honest inventory about the life that you imagine for yourself and what really brings you joy is going to be significant in making those decisions. And also um, aspiration. So I, I like to share this story because it kind of nails it, you know, it brings it home for you. So the picture that I am showing you with all of the shoes, this was a client that we moved who was using a walker. I would tell you that the first four rows of those shoes were high heels. You get it, right? She just wasn't being realistic. So it's really important. And then the other thing that happens when we start to organize and we start to bring things together is we see what we really have. So this was a client that we were downsizing. Um, do you see how many salt and pepper shakers they had? You know, maybe picking out a favorite. And then the same couple, this was, they had six coolers. They were not going to a place that had a garage. I don't even, well, I'm gonna jump the gun. I don't even have six coolers. I have one. So, you know, when we gather and we see what we have, it makes it a little bit easier to downsize. Okay, remember we talked about, and a couple of you raised your hand when you talked about the value of items. So here are a few things you can do. Um, there is an app called Google Lens that you can put on your phone. And um, you, you just type Google Lens on your phone. And when you see something, you want to have an idea of the value, a lot of times you can snap a picture of it and it will bring up kind of what it might cost. And you might bring up a link on Etsy or something like that. I really like that one. And... Um, the other thing I tell people is, you know, I, you have like a really nice dining room table or something that is really, really nice. And you think, oh, I should be getting X for it because I paid X for it. Well, you need to think about amortizing the use of that item, right? You might have paid $2,000 for it, but you used it for 20 years. So let's let's bring the value down. And again, most people's things are worth maybe 10% of what they think they are. And here's another story I like to share. So this jean jacket was my jacket back in 1985. I was uh, 15 years old and that was a $85 jacket. And I wanted that jacket. And I went to my parents and I asked them to pay for it for me for back to school. And they said, we are not spending them 85, 1985, $85 is a lot of money for a 15 year old's jacket. They said, how about if you really want this jacket, you pay for half of it, we'll pay for the other half of it. And I did, I did my $1 an hour babysitting and I got that jacket, which also is a significance of how important it is for kids to understand the value of money, but we're not talking about that today either. Anyway, I have held on to that jacket. I showed you, I have three children. My middle daughter wanted to take it with her to sleepaway camp. And I wanna also tell you that of my three children, my oldest has ADHD and my middle has OCD. And I'm not, I'm not that truly is, how it lives in my world. So I've been, I've learned a lot about the two, but my OCD daughter is incredibly responsible, very structured, always gets her homework done, doesn't lose things. Now, if my ADHD daughter had asked to take the jacket, I would have been like, there's no way. But with my OCD daughter, I'm like, okay, I'm going to look it up on eBay, which is what I tell my clients to do. And I'm going to see what guest jean jackets, authentic guest jean jackets from the 80s sell for. So my $85 jacket was on eBay for $35. So sometimes we need to just be realistic and eBay is a great way. And don't look at where it's listed, look at where it's sold. I will say that I did end up letting her take the jacket to camp and she did bring it back. And uh, had it been, you know, a thousand dollar jacket, I wouldn't have let her take it. But, but that's a good way to determine the value. All right. Why does being organized matter? Well, this National Soap and, Deter and Detergent Association said that getting rid of clutter eliminates 40% of our housework. So one reason that it's important to, to get rid of it is it reduces the toll that it takes to keep a house clean. It also um, reduces stress. And I always like to share this example. Actually, I'm going to wait till the next slide to share this. And the other thing that happens as a result of having too much stuff is that there is a statistic that we will spend 153 days of our lives looking for misplaced items. So if you want to get organized, you're going to save 40% of your time doing housework and you're going to get time back, not searching for things. So that's a pretty compelling reason to be organized. Um, what's that statistic right there? And then, okay, this is the exercise I want you to do. So I'm going to have you close your eyes just for a second. I want you to, first, before you close your eyes, I want you to see, do you think this guy was brilliant or what? <laughs> 
Um, he, he was Jean Piaget, and he was a Swiss biologist, psychologist, and I can't even pronounce the next word, epistemologist. But anyway, um, he was considered one of the most important thinkers of the century, and uh, that was his office. So I want you to close your eyes, and I want you to picture yourself in a room. There's stuff all over the countertops. You can't find a place to cook. There's clutter on the floor. There's a lot to trip over. Okay, open your eyes. Did anybody feel a tightening in their chest? No one? Okay, because I have had it happen where someone has said, stop, I'm, I'm not feeling good. So, I mean, that's how it is when we just picture it. So um, the, the results of clutter on our health are that we have lower subjective well-being, unhealthier eating habits, because think about it, if you can't prepare food in your home um, or you're not accessing the healthy food, you're probably not eating as well. You're going for the frozen meals or the instant meals. Um, you're going out, poor mental health, less efficient visual processing. Um, and the other thing is the cost associated with disorganization. I mean, a lot of times we will not know that we have something, we'll go out and we'll buy something else. So there's a lot of advantage. Another one that I'm not talking about, but one out of every 10 of us, um, I think I, sorry. Yeah, one of, out of every 10 of us, um, if I can figure out how to get rid of this. Um, okay. One out of every 10 of people in the US has off site storage. They say that's more than we have Starbucks. So, you know, we're storing a lot of things that we may not need. And I did not mean to go there. Okay, tips to organize and downsize. Um, the most common thread that you will hear in any of the major organizing um, movements, which how many of you have heard of Marie Kondo before, the magic art of tidying up? So that's a pretty popular one. Do you guys remember Peter Walsh? He used to be on Oprah and Rachel Ray, and he was one of those famous organizers. Um, I, and so both of these share the same thing. They, they tell you to start with visualizing the life that you want. And that's really important. And the other thing that I will tell you that I really like is um, Peter Walsh said that, you know, he used to go and do those like extreme homes that were pretty bad. And a lot of times if the adult is living poorly, the child is also living poorly in, in a lot of clutter. He said every single time that he had ever done a child's room, redone it, that when they opened the door and went into the room, 100% of the time they had the exact same reaction, which was they would dance. They would feel that lightness. So that's a really compelling reason to start to let go. Here is an easy tip that you can take with you. Um, the 10 minute timer. So this is an important part of it. You need to find a charity that means something to you. I always recommend it better to find one that will do pickups. And I got this resource for you. And these are all um, pickups that will um, come to your home. Um, and then obviously if there's a charity you really like and they don't pick up, you just need to make sure that you've got a plan to go there because what happens is if we spend, you know, this week organizing and decor and downsizing and getting our donations together and then the donation, we just drive around with the donations in our car, then it sort of defeats the purpose, right? Okay. So every day you set your timer for 10 minutes. 10 minutes is um, one bag is trash, which is hopefully fairly easy to make those decisions. And one bag is donation. That's all you do. But after one, and the other thing is you set the timer for 10 minutes. That's all you have to do. If you want to do more, great. But but we can, when we break things down into manageable pieces and we gain the momentum, there's that expression, how do you eat an elephant? Anybody know the punchline? Want to give it to me? One bite at a time, right. So let's just break it down into manageable pieces and gain the momentum. Um, and no matter what system you use, it needs to be one that works for you. Because, you know, that, that's, that applies to anything that we do. If, if you're not going to do it, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Don't invest in it. Don't buy the book. You have to be committed. Um, and so here's another couple of downsizing tips. Oh, actually, I didn't show you this one. Um, photos. How many of you have boxes of photos that you have done nothing with? So that, okay, that's pretty common. So first of all, it's really important with those old photos that you take care of those because they only have about 125 years of life. They were printed differently than paper, than photos are printed now, if we even print photos these days, right? So what's great is that um, 
you can actually divide them. And again, anything that you do, just having something that works for you, divide them into A, B, C, and D. And you don't have to rank them chronologically because I think what happens is people get stuck. They think it has to be perfect. And I always tell people, I used to say perfect is the enemy of done, but then I did Weight Watchers and they say progress, not perfection. Um, but anyway, um, you want to rank them A, B, C, D. And your A photos are the ones that you would display. They're your most important pictures. They're the ones that are really important. B is one that you would put in a photo album. C is you know who the people are and, and D is they're blurry. You don't even have any idea who those people are. So throw away the D. And what's really nice is your B and your C photos, you can actually just use a camera scanning app on your phone. I put one also on that sheet. And you can literally just take a picture of that picture as long as you don't have the shadows. And um, you can share those. Those are perfect to use for slideshows or um, social media. And that's all you need to do for those B and C photos. And then the A photos, you know, you might want to have them professionally digitized so that you don't lose them. And I actually, we have camera scanning equipment. I know companies that do it as well, where um, you can take a picture that's about this big and blow it to 18 by 20 and like really get a good quality photo out of it. Um, but also uh, doing it chronologically, a lot of times will slow you down. So just say, this is Sally's soccer. This is Jimmy's soccer. Like it doesn't have to be difficult. And then if you have, you know, those books where the glue, the photos are like stuck and they're super hard to get out. And you feel like if you're going to even try, you know, you're just going to tear the picture. You can actually use dental floss to, to get that glue off sometimes. Don't force it like if it's not coming, but, but dental floss is something that people don't think about. So I always like to address pictures because they're so important. Like when you ask somebody um, what they would grab in a fire, you know, photos are almost always on the list yet. We have these boxes of photos that we're not taking care of. Um, okay, so back to using a system. So when you are going through the process, being mindful of your space and your reach, um, I can't tell you how many people have ladders in their kitchens or step stools in their kitchen, and they have items that are so high up that they really have no business reaching. As we age, I don't know if you're aware of this, but we lose the mobility in our shoulders. So standing on a ladder and reaching up to grab something is not a good idea. So if you're going to be, you know, using something, it should be on a lower shelf that you don't have to climb. And if you're not really using it on a regular basis, that might be one of the things that you consider not keeping. They say that if you can replace it for under $20 or you're not really using it regularly, that's another good way of deciding what you should, should let go of. Um, we already talked about if you haven't repaired it, do you really need it? Um, I love, this helps me a lot, use, using organizational tools. Um, so you'll see that's actually my kitchen where I use those wire um, shelf things to make things more organized. But I also love bins and labels. They really help me to stay organized. Um, as I shared, you know, I'm, I, I am the poster child for disorganization. And I have, I have benefited so much by having people come in and organize me and get a system going. Um, another thing is using stickers in advance when you're going through the downsizing process. And I apologize, I left them in my car, but I have like a four pack of stickers um, that I get at Walmart and one's pink, one's green, one's orange and yellow. But you guys know those little stick ons that you can take off, you know, super easily. That's a good way if you want to start the downsizing process and you're not ready to really do anything, but you want to start thinking about it or even stickering a, a cabinet and, and say, OK, this is the stuff I'm going to use. And then I'm going to put another sticker. I'm going to tape over something I'm not going to use and see if I'm really using it. And then eliminating duplicates. Oh, you can actually see kind of a little bit in the bottom as the example of what those little stickers look like. And in this case, this uh, box full of um, coffee mugs was a client that we moved into a senior community. A lot of those were chipped. We didn't have enough storage space for them. So that would have been a good example. Some clients don't want us to sort with them. They, they don't get it. And we actually, I came over here today with a, um, from a client. We were moving them into a community and um, they had more boxes. They, they were going from a, like a 3,000 square foot home to a two bedroom in a senior living community. And they just didn't want to let go of things. And that can really create safety concerns. And um, so ha make, having those decisions proactively, making them early, making them as you go, definitely is, is easier on the process. Um, and then here are some things to also consider when you're sorting and asking yourself, when was the last time I used this item? Um, is this something I'll need again, like a VHS player? Is it necessary for my daily living? Is it safe for me to use? We talked about the ladder. Um, does this still fit and, and is it in style? And is it 
functional and easy to use. Like, you know, if you're not using your China and your crystal, maybe you don't need it anymore. Um, but if it brings you joy, you should keep it. Okay. Another one that is really um, helpful to think about is how many of you guys have ever heard of the 80-20 rule? Okay, so from what I understand, this started with Italian land use, but it really applies to so much in our life. And I like to give this example. What I hear is that we use 20% of what we have 80% of the time. So think about it. You're going on a vacation, right? You can't take everything that you own, but you're packing a favorite pair of shoes, a favorite jacket, favorite pair of pants. So when you start to think that way, the 80-20 rule, you really will find that you don't need everything that you have. All right, this is one of my favorite topics. This is the one that I like to save of all of the downsizing methods. Um, how many of you have heard of um, Swedish death cleaning before? One, one person? Okay, so from what I understand, this came about because somebody was clearing out um, their parents' home and thinking, oh my gosh, this is like a never ending process. This is daunting. And I don't want to leave this for my children to have to do for me. And so what it is, is it is proactively cleaning out our own homes as if we had passed. And it's, I know it's a little morbid to put it out there, but you know, we are all going to pass. So, you know, going through these things and making your wishes known is, is a gift that you can give to your loved ones. Like my grandmother, did not do. Um, so there are a few important things to take away from that. Um, first of all, start giving those things away to people who will enjoy them now rather than holding on to them. Um, and begin with things that you have in storage or hidden away, because usually you're not using them, so they're easier to discard than, than other things. Sentimental, if you start with sentimental, you'll never get through it. Um, another thing that I like that I never thought of before COVID is that you can actually do an, a show and tell with your family. So you can pick a designated time, have stickers, and you can start sharing items with loved ones over the computer and letting them know the story and seeing who wants them. And if they don't want them, at least you've shared that story. And I actually, as I shared with you, I went through a divorce and I had to go through that process myself and showing my kids the things that I had held on to. And then realizing that a lot of the things that I wanted, they really didn't care about. Um, and so like, for instance, these are some of the items that I had kept. The retainer. <laughs> It, okay, now this doesn't sound as crazy when I tell you why. I had this idea that if I put the retainer back in my mouth, my teeth would go back to being straight. That is not the case. So <laughs> um, I had kept my Girl Scout sash. I had kept my prom corsage. I had my little cheerleading. Um, I wasn't a real cheerleader. I was an optimist cheerleader. <laughs> and um, none of my kids wanted those things. But I get just as much joy showing you the picture as I do if I had held on to that item. So just remember, we really can photograph things. Um, but when you are going through the Swedish death cleaning process, how many of you would say that? Um, so I, I've, I've done this talk before. And I said to them, are there things that you might not want someone finding after you pass? And, you know, anyone say yes, that's the case. Anyone? Thank you for being honest. So, um, so, so what I tell people to do is, but they don't also don't want to discard it. They just don't want it found. So I said, this is what you do. You put it in a box and you write, do not open on the box. And then inside the box, well, how many of you think that if you packed a box and said, do not open, that somebody might open it anyway? Okay. That's where you put the tequila in. And you say, I, I told you not to open it, but if you're going to, I think you should have a laugh. So that's my, my take on Swedish death cleaning. It's called the Swedish, it's called a tequila box. So um, I know this may not apply to everybody. So I'm going to go a little bit faster on this part so, so I can give you some more resources. But it's really important if you are going to a smaller space that you're realistic about the space that you're going into, that you measure it. Um, it's amazing to me how many people want to make a move and they don't measure the furniture before they make those decisions. Um, the other thing is, that you don't have to keep a buffet as a buffet. It can be repurposed. So keeping furniture that you like and using it for other things is a great thing that you can do. Um, 
And here's another one that I like, and this is something that I tell people to do that are going into communities. You do a dining room table test or communities or just a smaller space. So what you do is you identify the, the mementos and the items, the decorative items that you love, and you put them all on a dining room table. And what you need to do is that sort of helps you decide like what's going to like what's going to go in the life, the life that the life boat, sorry, not the raft. Or yeah, the raft. Okay. But that's a good way of deciding which accessories and things that you will keep. Um, another one that we actually did, oh, this is got, I, I, not even touching it. And it's okay. There we go. So during COVID, my experience is that there were people who had considered moving to senior communities. And then remember the world shut down. So they were not moving. They were sitting stuck. So we did a, a talk and we put, put together some information on what do you do if you're at home and you know eventually you want to go to a community or to a smaller space, but the time is not now. So you can start by emptying out your dressers and your drawers. And I actually did this because I was going to sell my furniture and then I decided not to, but I emptied it all so that it could be photographed and sold. And then I put it back mindfully in a way that what am I really using? And I bet if you were to go home and start cleaning out your drawers and you haven't done it in a while, um, that'll be a, a really good way to start decluttering and figuring out what you really need. Okay. Um, available resources. Okay. How many of you have heard of circular economy? The circular economy? So a lot of what's happening now is that, um, as I shared, we have a, a minimalist generation. They don't want to necessarily go out and buy new things, right? You know, you've got the people that are buying the Ikea and the wafer, but then you also have people who are repurposing and reusing. So here are a few things that you can use and some really good resources that I want to share with you. Um, first of all, a lot, the, the, the number one call that I get almost consistently when someone is downsizing is, do you do estate sales? And um, the thing that people don't understand is that there are fewer and fewer companies available who want to do estate sales. And there are more and more people who are downsizing and leaving California or going to smaller spaces, and they want the estate sale. And back to, you have to have a market for something in order for somebody to, um, to, to be able to sell something. So um, estate sales, the estate sale companies are typically want to do the best of the best because they're going to work with you on a commission. And if they don't feel like there's going to be enough value of what you have left, then they're not going to choose you. The other thing is, if you don't have an area that's easy to put signs in front of, it's going to be harder to do an estate sale. And if you live in a community or a condominium that restricts it, you can't do an estate sale. So what do you do if you can't do an estate sale? So actually, there's something called Max Sold that's in this flyer that I gave you. You can actually do an online estate sale where you photograph everything that you want to sell. And you don't really even have to do it if you're if you're staying in your home but you don't want people coming into your house you can kind of set up your garage just like a garage sale online estate sale and um you can either manage it yourself or you can hire a company like ours will come in and assist you photographic catalog i usually want about a two-week lead time and then what's really nice is before anybody shows up to pay to they've already paid for it so anytime that they show up they've got a window they've already processed the credit card online and you have their names and they get a window of time so it's a very organized way to do it and it, it narrows it down to one day versus you know, having the garage sale and the setup and all of that stuff. Um, so yes. Called Max, sold. Max sold. M A X S O L D. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, then everybody knows about garage sales, and I always think that's a personal preference. I've always found that to me, it's not worth my time. But there are people who they love garage sales. It's something they look forward to doing every year. But I don't think I need to explain that. Is there anybody here that doesn't know what in it? Okay, I didn't think so. Sure. So I use, I believe they're Avery labels and you can, and they will say, they say that they peel off. Um, the, the, what labels do, do you use for stickers? And, you know, think of those garage sale, you know, the, the garage sale stickers that you can get at Walmart. Usually the stickers that I get are in that same section and those are meant to peel off easily. And they'll, they'll, they'll say that in the description. Um, okay, so a lot of people aren't familiar with what a liquidator or a buyout company does. So what we have is after a client has moved out of their home 
and gone wherever they're going, they usually ha will have a lot of things left behind. And um, we actually work with third parties called liquidators or buyout companies. And what they will do, and you have to do this in advance because it's not like you can just call them the next day. Um, and they will assess what you're leaving behind and they will compute how much do they think they can sell of what you're leaving and what is their labor cost going to be to clean everything now not clean i'm sorry but clear everything out of the house and they will usually make you an offer and that's as, as long as there's enough items of value that they think they can sell if they don't feel like there's enough saleable there then they will usually charge you but sometimes it's less expensive than calling a hauler and i personally think it's better for the environment because what they will do is they'll sell what they can sell They'll donate anything that they can't sell, and then anything that they can't do, then they'll then they'll dump it. But they don't just automatically go because the dump is the cheapest way to go for those hauling companies, and it's also got the worst impact on our environment. Um, I love this. Um, how many of you have heard of FreeCycle.org? FreeCycle.org. I see a hand. So FreeCycle.org. This is an example of how I used it. We were doing wheelchair and walker decorating event. Um, when I was first starting Silver Linings Transitions and I it was a new business, I didn't want to go out and spend a lot of money on decorations and supplies. So we looked on FreeCycle and somebody was giving away a bunch of old craft ribbon. So you can use FreeCycle to keep things out of the landfill that you would want to use or put back. In other um, programs that you can use are um, Buy Nothing on Facebook. How many of you are familiar with Buy Nothing in, in Facebook? Anybody? Okay, I'll tell you what that is. So Facebook is... It's, uh, it's a buy nothing group local to your area. So in order to get onto your Facebook buy nothing group, you basically have to prove where you live. And what you do is um, once you're on that little site, you can figure out who is um, who has things they want to give away and what do you want to give away. And I've used it personally. I've given things on free cycle, I mean, on buy nothing. And I've also put things on buy nothing. And um, curb alert with Craigslist. Curb alert is this furniture was actually my patio furniture. It was starting to break. I didn't want to put it into the landfill. I dragged it to the front of my house. I put a sign on it that said free. I put it on Craigslist curb alert. And by the end of the day, it was gone. That's a really good one to use. And another one that next door, a lot of people are using next door the same way that they're using buy nothing. Um, auctioneers, what we do when we're working with a client is if there are items that are of significant value, like we sometimes see like really expensive paintings or books or collections, we will pull those out before we do the rest of the, the liquidation. And then if you're going to sell things online, my favorite one that I feel is the safest, and again, don't want to have anybody in your home, if you can meet them in a public place, great. If that's not an option, you know, having it in your garage but still you're a little vulnerable, but Facebook at least gives you some sort of trail as to who that person is. That's the one that I have personally used when I brought people into my house to buy things. Um, and you'll see on this, it's also got some other really good sources that you can use for online apps. So this is a handout that you all have, and I can send a link to it if anybody wants it um, that's in the Zoom audience. And okay, parting words. Progress, not perfection. Um, one that I didn't share with you is um, sometimes we like spill something or we leave something and we're like, I'll get back to it later. Well, that contributes to our clutter. So if you can eliminate the word later, that will also help reduce your clutter. And then like I, I like to tell people, you know, it's hard to let go of things. It's hard to admit that something that I thought was going to happen didn't happen, or this thing that I paid money for I didn't use, or you know, this person that I loved is no longer with us, but I don't need to hold on to it. So um, reward yourself when you let go of those things and don't be hard. I mean, I think sometimes the worst, I, I heard this one podcast or a book and it was, um, if that little voice in your head was a roommate or a friend, would you be friends with them? So just be kind. That's so with that said, I'm actually done in time to answer questions. If anybody has any, yes. Consignment shops, there's probably less now after the pandemic. Sure. And everybody has their favorite consignment shops. And if it's an easy, so first of all, if it's a furniture item, what I recommend people do is you photograph it and send it to the consignment shop to see if they'll even take it. Because I mean, they're getting more and more selective. Again, we just went through a lot of people um, in COVID, they either accumulated, right? They either splurged or they purged. And um, a lot of people wanted to get rid of things. And so there has to be a place in the store for it to go on consignment. Um, clothing is- For big collection things like the whole room of dragons or I love Lucy. 
And that may be a better eBay situation. So always, if there's those kind of things go on eBay, I mean, what's nice for me is I'm part of a national association. So for instance, furs, um, furs are a little bit tougher, but I can go online to my national association and say, you know, does anybody have somebody who they know of is good about, you know, buying furs? And, you know, so that's what's great about having the internet at our fingertips is that we really can, you know, research. But definitely, uh, from what I understand about um, consignment, ARC is in La Jolla is probably the, the nicest of the consignment shops in the area. And some, I'm sorry, I didn't hear what it's called the ARC, A R K. And then sometimes what we'll do is we'll send pictures to the ARC, and then what they don't take, we'll go to um, Country Friends and um, see if they'll take it. Um, but those are of the, the, the nicer things, but it is harder and harder to consign, you know, things that aren't of higher value. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, regarding to the labels, uh, the question is, they don't care that much about the color, but what categories or words do you want them to represent? Oh, so what categories should they use for labels? So what I always think is a good thing to do is you label for donation, you label if you think something should be sold, if you think it's a higher end item, or if you have a loved one that, you know, you know, wants it, use a, a label for that. And that's actually a really good thing to do if you're doing the Swedish death cleaning is say you have several family members, you want to have a label for each family member, and that when you show them those items, then you could put a label on it based on who it is. Did that, hopefully that answered the question. Anybody else? That was the label question again. Yes. There is a store in Pacific Beach called Kitchens for Good. Thank you. Uh, you know about that. I do. So there, as she was sharing, there's um, a new uh, new charity called Kitchens for Good where you can donate kitchen items. And I believe they teach people how to... Well, when, they're, when the items then are sold, they use the money to teach people how to cook. Right. That's great. Yeah. So they, they use the money kind of like the way Goodwill will use the money that they're making to create jobs. That's what they're doing with Kitchens for Good, only they're teaching people how to go into catering and cooking. So it's a store you can actually it's store a, it on, let's say on you want a gas it. and horn blow. Okay. And you want a cuisine art or something or anything. Just go there and see it. It's amazing. And I believe they will pick up. Gas. Yeah, and I believe they will pick up actually as well, depending on what's there. Because I did talk to them actually, and that's a good reminder. Um, I should add that to this my resource list. And then I just got my QR code. So if you have any want to link to the website, that's it. But any other questions that I can answer for you? What do you think about paper clutter? <laughs> right so so paper clutter there's something called the sunday box how many of you have heard of it i think it's called the sunday box where i like this concept um but again i actually i paid for it because i'm like oh that's a great idea and you're supposed to every sunday you're, you're supposed to go through this. so any important papers or anything that comes through your house you're supposed to put into this Sunday box. And then on Sunday afternoon, you're supposed to sort through everything. And there's a, there's a way that you do it. And, um, but again, anything that you invest in, you have to actually execute the plan. Um, but what they say with paper is if it's something that you could easily find by searching online, you should let go of that paper. And then obviously there are things that you need for your taxes. And there's like a, you know, certain things, if you get it every month, you only need to keep the last month if you get it, you know, so, and actually I, I, we used to have it on our site, a guide to paper. Um, but, but from what I understand is if it's something that you could replace, you should get rid of it. And the other thing is our phones have great scanning apps now too. And that's a really good way of eliminating that paper clutter. But I, I, I love the concept of Sunday box. I just need to be disciplined enough to do it. I do, I will say this, I stick everything in the box. It's just whether I sort it. <laughs> That's why I said it's so good for me to give this talk because I understand, you know, I get it. I mean, there's no judgment coming from this podium. Any other questions? Yes. You kind of glossed over the idea of furs. What way people feel about furs in the state? I've got grandma's fur, mother's fur, and even a fur that I had. And... You know, I gloss over it because <laughs> it's kind of sad. It is. It is. And people don't want to hear, but you know, we know that, I mean, I have pictures of me posing in my grandmother's little mink stole, right? Like that was how we grew up, but that is not how these kids are growing up. 
And so if you do have a nice fur, I would go online and look for like a fur reseller and my time is perfect timing um, to see, I, you know, and there are some places that will still buy them. And if you really want me to send that resource to you, if you'll give me your name at the end, I can share it with you and um, you can look it up. The only thing I ever thought of was to donate it to like, um, what's the, the play area in Balboa Park? That oh, Balboa Park. Oh, Old Globe. Old Globe. Like yeah. Sometimes, but again, do you know how many people are trying to donate their furs? I mean, that's that's what you have to remember. I mean, I see furs pretty regularly. Yes. I have a couple of cups for college, and I asked somebody else about that, and they said, well, just have a teddy bear made out of it. Something for kids to I did that. Yeah, you, did that. <laughs> you know, I always wondered too. I wonder, and this is just me. I have no idea. So this is not me as a professional. This is me. I wonder if you could donate it to like a humane society or something so that animals could cuddle with it. Oh, see, there's one where they're placed. They're just very plays and things. Yes, yeah, so we were talking about using furs in, in, in theater. Yeah. Yes. There's a wonderful organization, and I do donated a few years ago, but it's still in existence. Uh, it's called Coats for Cubs, CBS. So it's like a 360 degree thing. You, you're wearing the fur coat, you donate it back into the wild or into this organization, and they make um, habitat for animals in the wild that are in injured and being rehabilitated. Oh, I love that. that. Didn't I just say that? Like donated to the, I was no, thinking. Uh, coats for cubs. Coats and for cubs. It's, um, it's in Virginia. It's a nice organization. And, um, I just got a box of them. Yeah. Um, pack, pack and save or whatever what it's called. Meant. And I just put my. It was I'm sorry. Here, but she was in there. And I thought I'm going back. What they were in the ministry stores. All three stores. Yeah. That's yeah. the turn. Okay. Um, Habitat for Humanity. One of the people on Zoom. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, Habitat for Humanity. One of the people on Zoom wanted to share. That's a good resale for furniture. It's a good place to donate. And I believe. Um, there's also one where you can donate, like if you have like old tiles or fixtures or things that you have not used. I think that's also Habitat for Humanity. I think they take those donations as well. Um, any other questions? Because I'm fine to go over. I just want to be respectful of everybody's time. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the people that were willing to raise their hands and makes it a lot more fun than me standing up here and just talking. And I had this like bright light. Yeah, it's not good. But I hope I hope I looked good anyway. <laughs> you know who takes use of the shoes and clothing that are not in here? You. I know that there are charities that will take shoes and they've done like shoe drives where they'll collect them from schools and it's like other countries where you know shoes are harder to come by. I can't think what it's called right now. I know, and that's just it. That's that's how we come up with ours. Or I come to a shop and I'm like, oh, I need to add tissue for this. Okay. Yes, thank you so much for moderating. Did you say you can send me something about first? Yes, I will. Can um, you email it? Yeah. Let me. Um, okay. Okay. 